We're grateful that you're here this morning, excited to continue our Set Apart Sermon Series, which is taking a look at the Bible's teachings on holiness. Uh, Like most people, I've always had a strange relationship with this idea of the word holy. It's felt really obscure, it's felt very detached, hard to grasp. Um, it's, It's something that as Chris and I reflected on the Extended Cut podcast this last week, it's something that can often just conjure more images than like even ability to describe or words to give vocabulary to. Like it's just a challenging idea sometimes. And I love what Pastor Chris said in his sermon last week. He said, holiness can feel like something to only be observed, not experienced. And that's been my experience often throughout my life. Additionally, I think that the word holy often comes with some baggage in our world. Holiness is an attribute that many Christians avoid claiming or pursuing uh, because it's often attached to this image of self-righteousness. It's often kind of this like holier than thou, uh, I'm a Christian so I live my life this way, this way and I know that non-Christians don't like that and they don't like the idea of someone trying to be holy and all these kinds of things and so I don't know about you, this is a term that throughout my life I've like not even wanted to attribute to myself or something that I've wanted to really pursue or like say that I'm trying to be holy. But I think that this does a discredit to not only what the Bible says about who God is, but the call that we are supposed to be. Holiness is how God is described all throughout the scriptures, as we considered last week in Pastor Chris's sermon, and it's how we're called to be. 1 Peter 1.16 says, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, You shall be holy, for I am holy. So even though this is a difficult concept for us to understand, it's something that we should really take the time to consider and understand. And that's exactly what we're doing in this sermon series. Since the dawn of time, humans have always sought to uh, develop ethical systems that prescribe their understanding of morality. And I think it's pretty clear that, like, The ideas of holiness and morality are often closely connected. One of the reasons why we believe God is holy is because he's good. He's great. He's perfect. He doesn't do wrong. He only does good things. And humans have a lot of different ways that we kind of develop or consider what is right and what is wrong. You have a theory like divine command theory where God defines and instructs right and wrong. You have ideas like utilitarianism, a perspective that focuses on results or consequences to determine right or wrong. Natural law, where humans possess intrinsic values that govern our reasoning or behavior. Egoism, where we behave with our own interest as central focus. Moral relativism, what's morally right varies from culture and time and location. And when you look at Western society, you see all these systems of thought, all these different kinds of ideas and ways to determine what is right and wrong at work in our culture. Divine command theory and natural law are well accepted and practices by most religious folks. You see utilitarianism when you see riots or violent protests because the good that's produced outweighs maybe the wrong that has to happen in that moment, in that viewpoint. Egoism is well exemplified in our culture today as we live in one of the most self-centered moments in human history. Moral relativism is often exemplified through the ongoing evolution of right and wrong across periods in time, cultures, social statuses, and more. Everyone has a system. And even religious folks like ourselves are tempted to utilize some of the systems and frameworks from that of the world outside of something like divine command theory or natural law. Even though you're totally team Jesus and believe his teachings and commands and his way of life is the best, you occasionally make decisions based off what feels right and best for yourself. Or you may compromise on a theological point because that specific belief feels less good or less loving than what you feel to believe is the best choice. We're ethical creatures. And while many are humble and would admit that they don't get everything right all the time, we still find that most people presume themselves to be pretty good ethical beings. I've worked for the Gray City Church family for about eight years now between my time in Corvallis and Eugene, 
And I've spent many, many days on college campuses evangelizing to students up and down the West Coast, in Tennessee, in Texas. This is a priority of our campus ministry. It's something we do. We're intentional to go on campus and create conversations about faith and about Jesus because we believe that people need to hear the good news that has changed our lives. This process usually starts by an individual or a pair of individuals asking questions from a predetermined evangelism tool uh, or a prompt to get a stranger to share what they believe. One of every nation, the kind of global church family that we belong to, uh, one of their tools for this is called the God Test. And it's a survey that does record actual data as they continue on trying to research what people believe on the college campuses. And it has a series of questions that are included in the survey that ask, first, do you believe in heaven? Second, do you believe all people go to heaven? And third, do you believe you will go to heaven? And without fail, whether the individual is Christian or not, every time I've asked this question, the third question there, do you believe you will go to heaven? The individual says yes. And it's usually followed up with a comment like, well, yeah, I mean, there's a lot worse people out there than me. Or yeah, I mean, I think I'm a pretty good person. Like, I, I try to be generous, I try to be kind, I try to treat people better than myself, and yeah, most people believe they are generally morally good, and that if there is a God in an afterlife with him, that they deserve to be there, because they mostly live up to whatever ethical system they believe to be true. Most people think that they're good, that their ethics are correct, and that if there is a heaven and an eternal relationship to be had with God, they deserve it. Well, the story of the Bible ends, on, ends up going on to tell us that humans are not very good. Uh, but it doesn't start that way. The story of the Bible starts with all of creation being considered good. For the first couple of chapters, everything in the story is reflected on by God as either good or very good. There's no mention of sin, brokenness, or anything unholy in all of God's creation. Last week, we saw how scripture reveals God's holiness, and holiness is this weighty word. Um, when we say that God is holy, we recognize that he's set apart, unlike anything else. And today, in our message, we're going to examine how sin affected our ability to relate to a holy God and understand what was lost and what we know as the fall. Today, we're looking at how holiness was lost by humanity how sin caused man to lose what could only be found in God. For our teaching text today, we're going to be in Genesis 3, 1 through 8, probably one you're familiar with if you've been around the church at all, um, but as we'll consider later on, still extremely valuable for us to frequent often. We're going to be uh, in the ESV translation, but whatever you have is great. Here's what it says, Genesis 3, verse 1 through 8. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray before we continue on. Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to consider your word today. Lord, this is a text that many of us are familiar with. Uh, a text that many of us even uh, are tempted to just kind of skip over because we've, we've read it, we've considered its implications. Uh, but Father, this is such a, a critical story, it's such a critical moment, especially as we consider this journey of what the Bible says about holiness and how we ought to pursue it and how we can relate to you and all these great things. And so Father, today we just ask that you would be here with us and that you would help us, 
that you would illuminate the scripture to us to, to change us. We don't want to walk out of here the same today. And so we invite you to do that. Thank you for community and the, just the beautiful moment we get to have together here today, uh, considering your word and its implications. We just pray that you would bless this time and that you'd be honored by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I want to take a few minutes to unpack the text here. Genesis 3 begins by introducing us to this character of the serpent. Later on in scriptures, like in Genesis 20, 19, or 19, 12, 9, there we go, it is revealed that the serpent is the devil. The serpent is part of God's created order, made by God, but not equal to him. He's crafty, he's cunning, or shrewd, and he has a deceiving nature, and he plans to deceive Eve. The first thing we hear from the serpent is, indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? This statement implies that the serpent was aware of God's command in Genesis 2. Here we see the true motive of the serpent is to question God's word. Eve begins in this place of recognizing God's authority to determine what is right and wrong and to receive commands from him. And she admits that she believes what God has said regarding the consequences for eating the fruit. But the devil pushes her further, saying, Is that what God really said? You will not surely die. And oh, doesn't he do this to you and I still? How many times when we're facing, tr- facing temptation, do you and I have these moments where we're tempted to think, I might be able to get away with it. I got away with it last time and nothing happened. Or I've been doing this practice for so long and there doesn't seem to be any apparent consequences. I think I can press on. I think everything's going to be okay. I don't actually have to believe what God has said to be true about the outcome of this because so far, so good, and I'm just going to continue to press on. Family, can I remind you this morning that the devil is alive and he's a liar. He's pushing you. He's trying to get you to question God's word, not in some healthy, like trying to understand it more and want to look at the context and try to be built up, But in questioning, is this true? Is this real? Is this right? Is that what God said? You know, I like the concept of Christianity. I like maybe the meat and potatoes, but those veggies, the the side parts that are kind of icky and gross, like I just kind of want to push that to the side. That's, That's the devil that questions and forces us to question God's word. He knows what God has said, and he's working day and night to ensure that you and I don't believe it. His tactics are still the same. This is what he does. First, he forces us and and pushes us to question God's words. Second, he seeks to minimize the cost of disobedience. He wants you to think and believe that the consequences won't actually happen for, for this. He's just trying to scare me. He's just trying to put this like daunting, heavy hand over me. But so far, I've been walking in this, and I've not ran into any big issues. And so he wants you to think very little about the consequences of sin. And third, he wants to paint a false reality of freedom apart from God. He wants you to believe that these rules, these commands, these teachings from God are just here to limit your life, and true freedom is actually found outside of them. The serpent had deception planned for Eve, and he seeks to deceive you too. He takes advantage of you on your weekdays when you're burnt out and you're tired and you're sick and you're exhausted and you're facing difficult circumstances and he tries to partner in with lies and with problems, trying to force you to look at God and say, why, what's happening, what are you doing, I don't believe you anymore. But Satan also creeps in on the good days. It doesn't just have to be like, oh, I'm having a really bad day, I'm really weak and susceptible, but there's ways that Satan fights. I mean, think about the the context of this story. Adam and Eve are in the garden with God, the one who created them and loves them and has provided everything for them. This is like best case scenario, and still Satan is able to creep in. So even on your best days, even when you're really struggling, or like when you're not struggling, or when you're just feel like everything is high and mighty and great, Satan can still find that one thing like he did for Eve. Where he says, you sure God said that? He finds the one thing that you might, might derail you, that might force you to question or have doubt or have concern. I've heard many, from many pastors and, and participants as well over the years that oftentimes 
the moment that people are susceptible, most susceptible to fall back into sin is like right after this like big conference high. I've heard of pastors confessing that they just gave a big keynote speech or presentation at a conference and then they get back to their hotel and they watch pornography, travel back home to their wife and conceal it and don't say anything. Because the enemy, even on the best and most powerful days, tries to find that foothold, tries to find the thing that can take us down. Satan still aims to do this today. His tactics are still at work. He wants you to question God's word, to minimize the cost of disobedience, and to paint a false reality of freedom apart from God. Satan's questioning forces Eve to consider the forbidden fruit in a way that she probably never had before. I mean, the text highlights her reflection, these positive attributes of the tree. And she calls it good and delightful and desirable. It's like she had never really considered it or looked at it that closely. But this temptation has opened her mind to consider something in a new way. She ultimately chooses to trust in what looks good or feels desirable above what God has commanded and said. Not only does she sin, but she passed it on to her husband who ate as well. Genesis 3, 7 says, Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. Their eyes were opened to this point that they recognized they were naked. There was an innocence lost. This shows that the serpent was not entirely dishonest about the fact that their eyes would be opened if they ate the fruit. And Satan doesn't always approach us with just full-on outright lies, but often with little half-truths that cause us to entertain what we know is forbidden. And the story ends with Adam and Eve hiding from God as they hear him walking toward them in the garden. The same garden where they walked with him every day and enjoyed his company and his presence and his provision. They now hid from him. Interestingly, God's eyes were not the ones that were opened. Their shame was not a result of God seeing them. It was the result of them seeing themselves with sin in the picture. The story tells us what is ultimately wrong with humanity's ethical problem. That we have abandoned the truth of God, entertained the lies of the enemy, and that we seek to find healing or fullness in systems that are incomplete and incongruent with the way of God. When humanity made this choice, there would be and continue to be consequences for our sin. So in our first point today, we're going to take a look at what was lost through sin. And some of this is kind of heavy and sad, um, but that's important to feel. Uh, And I promise you the good news that's on the other side of this is fantastic. But to understand what we lost through Adam's cosmic decision, let's first examine what mankind had before it. God had made them in his image and likeness. God created them to rule over creation. God commissioned them to be fruitful and multiply and subdue the earth. God provided food for them. God placed them in a very good creation. He placed them in a luxurious garden. God gave them permission to eat freely except for from one tree. Again, this sounds like the life. Perfect relationship and purpose through connection with the creator God who made you. But sin changed everything. First, we lost our connection with God and now experience separation. Isaiah 59, 1 through 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. God is set apart, and our sin caused us to lose the relational connection that we were designed to have with our Father. Like Adam and Eve, we were made to walk in the garden in close proximity with the Father, but our sin separates us from our holy God. Many can struggle to understand this and often judge God over that he would hold such high expectations over his creation and that he would withhold relationship from them for sin. But we don't struggle with this when it comes to our interpersonal relationships. We recognize interpersonally that there's consequences when lines are crossed. When I have a committed relationship with somebody and there's stipulations of how we exist and how we relate to one another, whenever those are broken and trust is violated, we understand the consequences. If my wife asks me to snag something on the way home from work at the end of the day, 
I say, yeah, 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 for sure. I'll be sure to do that. But then as the day goes on and my priorities just kind of get out of whack and I forget and I just go straight home because I'm really tired, it's easy to sit there and me want to be offended at, at her frustration towards me. Well, don't you understand my, my hard day or all these kinds of things that can come to mind? But I'm the one that told her I'd make it a priority. I'm the one that told her I would do it. And now I have to understand that there are consequences for breaking trust. That when I came home and did not fulfill what I said, I have to be okay recognizing she might be a little upset at me. She might not want to talk to me for 10, 15 minutes. Yes, she should forgive me eventually. Yes, we should come around and be able to connect again. Uh, but we, have to, we recognize that interpersonally, there are consequences when we violate trust and when we break the relational stipulations. So why would we not believe that that same idea is present with the God who created us? With the God who made us and gave us our complete design. Who said this is the way of flourishing of what's going to bring goodness not just to you but to the entire world that I put you in. So when we break command, when we break those relational stipulations, we should be humble to understand that there are consequences. We were designed for a purpose. We were designed to relate to God in a certain way. And our sin caused us to lose that ability to connect with him. The second thing we lost was our right standing with God as we become children of wrath. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 tells us, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. When unholiness cursed the human experience, something changed in our hearts and mind. The Bible uses language like a disease that we inherited, the good qualities and right standing that we once had with God and that we once more naturally walked in change as we've become children of wrath, perpetuating brokenness and sin in the world just as the deceiver Satan does. Third, we lost our purpose and now we go our own way. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The term sheep has kind of been co-opted by modern politics in a lot of ways. And so many of us, when we hear something like that, we, we think of this idea that, uh, you know, it's someone who, who doesn't think for themselves or blindly follows authority. But it's funny because the Bible uses the term very differently when it refers to people as sheep. Instead of referring to the tendency of blindly following authority, the Bible often uses the metaphor to refer to the dangers of living with no authority. Sheep are not wise creatures. They're unfortunately dumb. Which does make the Bible's metaphor with us as the sheep a little tough. They can't take care of themselves. They're vulnerable to attack from predators. And they're prone to wander away from the flock and lose any kind of communal protection that they may have had by strength and numbers. And if we take an honest look at our ability to lead our own lives, this metaphor probably rings pretty true for our experiences. More true than we'd like to admit. We need a shepherd. Someone to guide us into the fulfillment and peace and joy that he's promised. But sin in our hearts causes us to believe that we're best on our own. To not think so clearly about our decisions, their consequences, and the danger that we've put ourselves and others in. Next, we've lost our provision, and now we sweat for our existence. Genesis 3, 17-19 says, Cursed is the ground because of you, and pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread. Because of sin, even nature itself works against us. And the tasks and responsibilities that were originally given to us that were supposed to cause so much joy and, and life and excitement as we're partnering with God are now met with difficult resistance and pain. The struggles that you feel at work you know, or the, the things that you deal with vocationally that you're like, man, I just wish we didn't have to put up with this. Like, those are consequences of, this, of the fall. I still believe that like, the, the tasks that God gave people in Genesis, like Adam and Eve, would probably still require some toiling. 
but there's a, there's a joy and a purpose and a, a desire to honor and please God and to receive that that was lost through that process. Next, we lost our confidence and now we experience shame. When Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, their eyes were open to recognize that something was very wrong, that they were wrong and had broken the order of how things were, how they were supposed to relate to God. Now, shame is one of the most overwhelming and disruptive human experiences we face. It's widespread, each of us dealing with it in our own unique ways. Some people on really uh, hidden, more quiet side of things. Some people very upfront, very obvious to notice how ashamed somebody is. And we feel a lot of shame specifically without the way God sees us. Well, how could such a holy and perfect God want to ever consider being in relationship with someone broken and sinful and corrupt like me? Shame has ruined our ability to even believe, like it says in Genesis 1, that we were made in the image of God because we're, we just feel our corruption and our brokenness on such a nasty level. Next, we lost our connection with others and now experience alienation and broken relationships. Job, a notably righteous and God-fearing man in the Old Testament, who would, you would think of anyone would have the opportunity to get to walk in really great relationships, speaks of his experience. It says in Job 19, verses 13 to 15, He has put my brothers far from me, and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. Because of sin, we experience a variety of difficulties in maintaining relationship with others, even with our closest friends. Pride, comparison, disunity, arguments, fighting, all these kinds of things are present realities, even with the people that we love and are closest to. And finally, we lost our awareness of how terrible sin is and now attempt to justify our sin. You know, where I see this most is in the way that we can tend to create like a hierarchy of sins. I have a slide here. Um, we often see something like, oh, it's a, it's a white lie. Like no one, no one knows. It's a pretty minor thing. Like it's not that significant. It's not a big deal. Theft is a little bit bigger, uh, especially depending on what you're stealing. Um, <laughs> sexual sin, we, like, we know it's bad, know we shouldn't do it, but we also know that God forgives us. Uh, but it's, it's very serious, and so we need to take it seriously. And then finally, like murder to us is like, that's, that's borderline unforgivable. I don't have a scripture that says that's not true, <laughs> but I feel that way. And that's like often how we consider like the degrees of sin. And yes, typically the amount of damage and severity of consequences can vary based off these kinds of actions, but they are still all chaos-creating, anti-flourishing actions that perpetuate the destruction of ourselves, the world, and our relationship with God and others. When we participate in any sin, regardless of size or impact, we are choosing to walk in the way of Satan, who only seeks to destroy God's good world. Sin is terrible at every single level. Okay. That was a lot of heavy realities. Uh, ready for the good news? The one thing that was not lost because of sin was God's pursuit of fallen humanity. And this leads us to our second point, what we have gained through Christ. You see, fortunately for humanity, the fall of mankind is not the end of the story. Genesis 3.21 even records God's grace to Adam and Eve as he says, The Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. In Genesis 3.7, Adam and Eve attempted to cover themselves, but God clothed them by making garments out of skin crafted from a dead animal. Blood had been shed to cover Adam and Eve's sin. This was the foreshadowing of how God would eventually heal all of humanity. In our fallen state, we try to create our own coverings to deal with shame and fear and brokenness caused by sin. However, just as it was with Adam, our attempts to cover our own sin are inadequate. So God had to do something for us 
that we could not do for ourselves. Now, everything lost in sin is restored in Christ. He undoes everything that sin caused. First, he restores our connection to him. First John 4, 9 through 10 says, In this the love of God was made manifest among them, that God sent his one and only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Have you ever considered like why we pray the phrase, like we wrap up a prayer by saying, in Jesus' name, amen. I'm actually very intentional to try to do that in my prayers. As a child, I thought it was kind of like this clarifying remark of like, well, you know, I got to remind myself and whoever I'm praying to that it's to them. Uh, Like like Satan could come and snag it and be like, ha, he didn't say in Jesus' name, so I'm (laughs) taking this prayer. But it's, it's much deeper than that. There's, there's, there's far more substance to why Christians pray in Jesus' name, amen, because we have had restored access to the Father only because of what Jesus has done for us. I can only pray to God and believe that he hears me and loves me and is working on my behalf because I pray in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the bridge that I need in order to be connected to the Father once again. Jesus restores our connection to him. Next, he restores our right standing with him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That we might become the righteousness of God. Does that not sound blasphemous? I feel like I have no reason to ever get to say that I could be the righteousness of God. Especially as I get older and get married and become a father and an employee, I recognize how deeply broken I am. How often I hurt people. How often I'm so selfish. How I'm like so prone to make mistakes and to hurt people. This feels like the last thing that I should be able to pray and believe is a true status about me. But in Christ, we have a restored right standing with God, that we have received a new status, like a court order that you walked in and you did not deserve getting let off from. But they say, you're free, go. I got pulled over when I was in college. I I didn't have updated registration, uh, my tags, I didn't, have, uh, I didn't have an insurance card and all these guy, things. And I told the guy it was my dad's car, which it was technically, mine to drive. And uh, he said, all right, you're free to go. Make sure your dad takes care of that. I was guilty. I, I, should have, I should have gotten consequences for that action as the driver of the car who's responsible to make sure that all of those things are in the car and are current and active. But he let me go. He gave me a a status I didn't deserve. Through Jesus, we receive a right standing status with God that we don't deserve. That's not something we ever earned or could earn, but something that we get through Jesus. Next, he restores our purpose. Philippians 3, 13 through 14 reminds us, But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When we are in Christ, we receive purpose that transcends all of our earthly circumstances. You know, when, we don't, when we're not in Christ and we're just going about doing our daily lives, so many things just feel like it's, it's just a rat race. Like I'm, I'm just on this wheel that's never going to end. Why do I continue to do this? Why do I try so hard in this relationship? Why do I try so hard vocationally? I just feel like I'm in the same spot on and on and on. But in Christ, we receive a purpose that is eternal and life-giving and fruitful for whatever circumstances we find ourselves in. You receive a mission and a call from God to participate in what he's doing in the world around us. Next, he restores his provision for us. Philippians 4.19. I forgot to update these. That's funny. I got some spelling. I literally, 
I like showed somebody ahead of time. I was like, look at me. I spelled that wrong. And uh, then I didn't fix it. Yeah, that's uh, Philippi- uh, Philippians. <laughs> Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I've been walking with Christ, you know, notably a lot shorter than some in this room, uh, but long enough to know that God is a provider, that he cares so deeply for his children. And he doesn't always give us the lavish life that we might believe and dream that we could have. Like, it's, it's not this prosperity thing that, like, if I just believe hard enough, like, God's going to give me everything under the sun that I need. But God takes care of his kids. When they run into hard troubles, when they run into difficult times, God is near and he helps. He creates opportunities to keep taking steps forward so that they can be provided for and cared for in the things that he's called them to. Through Christ, God has restored his provision for us. He's restored our confidence before him. Hebrews 10, 19 through 22 says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. When we are in Christ, shame has no place in our life. We can have confidence that all the sins that we have committed are forgiven, that the ones that will continue to do are forgiven, and that we get to walk in Christ's grace and mercy and continue to press on and be sanctified, changed to his likeness as we grow. We can have confidence before the Lord, regardless of the ups and downs of your life, regardless of your sins. We have confidence before the Father that we can approach with, with just eagerness and boldness and trust, full transparency, full vulnerability, because he sees Christ over us and recognizes us as his children and invites us in. Tim Keller had this beautiful quote for a long time about you know, the, only, the only person who would, open, who would wake up a king at 3 a.m. for a glass of water is a child. And you have that kind of access with your father. And finally, he restores our relationships. For all the brokenness and all the troubles we face relationally, God, through Jesus, creates a new community, as reflected on in Acts 2.42 and 44, that says, as they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. There's a new family to be a part of. Your earthly family might be messy, The friends from your past life might be really complicated, especially if you're walking into a relationship with Jesus. But There's a community, there's a family to be had that reflects the same grace and mercy and love that we receive from Jesus Christ. Family, this is good news. I don't care how many times you've heard this. This is worthy of celebration today and every single day. When you and I did absolutely nothing to deserve this kind of love from God, He chased us down and offered us life again in Christ. He could have abandoned us. He probably should have started over with someone new, but he didn't. He looked down at sinful, rebellious humanity and said, those are my people. They bear my image. I made them to reflect my goodness, my purpose, my calling in the world. I will make a way for them to be right again. I need to speak directly to some of you in this space today. Some of you believe in your head and heart in what Christ has done for you, but you let shame run your life and hold you back from all that he has for you. You're held back by your regret from your life before Christ or the shortcomings you have now. You feel like you just can't live up to be the Christian you're supposed to be, the the parent or the spouse or the friend. I need to remind you this morning that those are lies from hell. The enemy looks at you and says, well, they might have saving faith and eternal life ahead of them with Christ, but I'm going to make the meantime very painful, very destructive, very hard. The voice you hear in the back of your head that tells you that you're too broken, you're not doing enough, you're not good enough, that's not a voice from God. 
That's the deceiver. That ancient snake from the garden who will do anything he can to make your life difficult and full of hate and frustration and brokenness. The enemy wants you to think that, you, that sin is holding you back. But God reminds you that what has been done for you in Christ changes everything moving forward. That you have a new status, a new posture, a new place that you get to exist and dwell in relationship with the Father. And when the enemy reminds you of your sin, you need to remind him and yourself of what Christ has done for you. You need to fight back with the scriptures, with the truth. Dr. Sam Storms has brilliantly explored this topic in his book, A Dozen Things God Did With Your Sin. Um, he, he He summarizes the Bible's teachings in, in 12 points. He has laid your sin upon his son. Can we say amen? amen? He has forgiven you of your sins. Amen. He has cleansed you of your sin. Amen. He has covered your sin. Amen. He has cast all your sin behind his back. Amen. He removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. Amen. He has passed over your sin. Amen. He trampled over your sin underfoot. Amen. He cast your sin into the sea. Amen. He blotted out your sin. Amen. He turned his face away from your sin. Amen. And lastly, and probably most powerfully to me, he has forgotten your sin and he refuses to remember it. Amen. Therefore, we can, yes, amen. Therefore, we can believe and receive when we pray a verse like Romans 8.1 that says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. None. Not even a little bit. You are in Christ and you are a child of God. Praise God for this beautiful reality. Would shame be gone and fall off our shoulders in the name of Jesus? Here's the other phenomenal news for you this morning. There's nothing you can do to earn this connection back with our holy God except to believe and receive salvation in the name of Jesus. All you must do is receive the undeserved and unmerited love of God. God does not watch your life and see the ups and downs of you trying your best to follow him with like judgment or an attitude of just this, this frustrated spirit. Colossians 3, 1 through 3 tells us, if you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things of the earth. For you have died and your life is now hidden in Christ. Consider that language. Your life is hidden in Christ. Shame makes you feel like you're exposed. Everyone knows. Everyone sees me. I gotta hide this. I gotta try my best to suppress it. And everyone that does see it judges me. God judges me. But when God looks at you according to this verse, He does not see a sinful and broken person worthy of judgment and condemnation. He, see, he sees Jesus Christ's imputed righteousness that has been given to you. 1 John 2 1 calls Jesus an advocate with the Father for us. When the Father looks at you, He sees Jesus put his arm around you and say, yeah, they're with me. They're good. Can they go on? So you don't have to live your life self-conscious or scared that your right standing with God changes based off your diligence and spiritual disciplines or the sin you committed last night or your ability to change and grow as fast as your peers. You're saved. You're secured. You're loved. Yes, we ought to prioritize our our experiential connection with God and live the life that he's called us to because it's available in Christ and the power of the Spirit. Those are all critical things. I don't mean to diminish that. But your ability to live up to some standard does not change God's opinion of you. I lived in fear and shame for a long time for the sins that I just could never break loose of. Feeling like, man, if, if anyone else learned about this, they'd know I'm such a fraud. And to, to a certain extent, felt like even in my, my relationship with God, felt like a fraud. It's like, yeah, I know on paper that I have this connection with you, despite the struggle, despite growth and all these things. But 
man, I just, when I sit here and pray, when I sit here and read my Bible, I, I just feel like I, I don't deserve this. I've, I've got issues. I've got things I can't shake. But as time has gone on, I have found that the, the, the best medicine for healing and growth is just to continue confessing your weakness over and over again. And not just in times of prayer, but in times to one another as well. That has actually been where maybe some of the greatest freedom in my life has come. I could pray a thousand times to God, saying I'm sorry, saying I want to change, I'd like things for change. But man, something just happened when I began to communicate my need for God's intervention in my life with someone else. It says in the book of James that when we confess, we find healing. I believe that to be true. If you're wrestling with shame, you can, you can find healing through the confession of your sin, not as some like, merit-based system, but as an opportunity to experience God through your vulnerability and transparency, through the community of, of tangible love that he's placed you in. I, I can tell you, like, getting to confess sin to others has made me so much more aware of God's love for me because if the people around me can love me in spite of my issues, how remarkable it is that God feels the same, but even greater so than they could. Humans still have limits. There's still certain things that, like, that's going to be really tough to work through. But God's love is so great for us that we can confess and trust that he wants to heal us and change us and grow us. This is amazing news for us. That this isn't on what we can put together, but it's on God's Holy Spirit changing us as we accept the salvation that we receive freely from Christ. And finally, we ought to respond to this good news through boldness and confident worship for what Christ has done for us. Celebrate this good news every single day through worship and prayer and fellowship in the church by telling everyone around you what Christ has done for you. Combat the enemy's lives through worship and celebration of salvation in Christ. This is not news to hear and say, you know, in a couple years, I'm sure they'll come back around to Genesis 3 because probably should as a church. Or This is not news to slip past because I've heard a, a dozen sermons on this and I just want something a little deeper. The most fundamental truth about who you are is that you are in Christ. And Satan is working to do everything he can to snatch this truth from your heart. This is a war we all face. A war against fear. A war against shame and condemnation. And we must celebrate the freedom that we have in Christ each and every day like it was the first time you heard this good news. Because Satan is working day and night to try to get you to forget it. Peter wrote in 1 Peter 5, 8-9, through 9, Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The devil isn't just working to get the lazy, unattentive, ignorant Christians. He wants all of us. All over the world, people are held back by shame or by the belief that they have to do something in order to earn God's favor. And the devil loves to use those ideas to keep us down every day. Be intentional to recognize, remember, and celebrate what Christ has done for you. Worship team, you can come on up. I wanted to close today by reading a poem uh, from a book called Liturgies for Hope. Uh, it's, it's been a, a really great resource for me in a lot of different seasons of life. There's times that we know what to pray, what to say, how to say it. Uh, and then there's times that maybe we're so overwhelmed or so taken back that we kind of struggle to put together the words that we'd like to use. Um, and I've found that working through other people's prayers can often provide a lot of powerful language um, to, to what I need to be able to more clearly think. And so liturgies in, in a religious context can become this a very like overdone thing that loses heart connection and all that. Um, but I, I think it can also be very powerful. And I'll be honest, in this last season of my life, I've, 
I feel like I've lost a lot of the capacity I have at times to fully communicate what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking. And it's been the prayers of others that have really helped open and unlock a lot of ideas and thoughts that I need to hear. And I wanted to read this as we close before we pray. It's called A Liturgy for Those Who Can't Be Good Enough. They say, O oh Lord, deficiency is in our marrow and decay is in our bones. We have attempted godliness and been found wanting. Your faultless eyes scan the earth, searching for one who understands, seeking someone who hungers after you, but no one is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks you. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and we are unaware of just how far from your goodness we have wandered. We hardly have words, O oh God, to convey the depths of our spiritual poverty and our insufficient ability to earn your favor. If the wages of sin are death, then we have justly earned our end. Help us, Lord, for we do not know the way to life. We have the desire to do what is right, but lack the ability to carry it out. Who will save us from our destiny of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. He is merciful, though we fall short. Gracious, though we were his enemies. Slow to anger, though we repeatedly stray. Abounding in love, though we deserve condemnation. Relenting from disaster and releasing us from a debt that we cannot pay. Holy Father, we cling to your character of more worth than gold. We accept your grace and the honor of being your ambassadors. We treasure the good news that sinners can be reconciled to you. Like the thief who hung alongside you on the cross, remember us, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. We cannot reach you by ourselves, but you bridge the gap between us with your body and blood. The old has gone, the new has come. Amen. Lord, we are so thankful for the hope we have in Christ. Restoration to you, our Father. Lord, we, we do want to take the moment, the, the humble posture of recognizing our depravity and our brokenness. That we have rebelled. We have alienated ourselves from you because of our sin. Help us experience the weight of that decision. Because it's in that recognition, in that weight, that we get to really full the, feel the fullness of your love for us through Christ Jesus. The amazing thing that you've done for us on the cross and the life that you have given us in him. We thank you for this, Lord. I pray today that you would speak encouragement to those who are experiencing shame, like a, like a weight that's just been on, the, on their shoulders for too long that it would just roll off fall down, the, down a hill and into a grave. We're in you, God. Shame is not something we need to experience or walk in any longer. Lord, I pray for those who feel like they've been just striving so hard to earn this on their own. Lord, would you help us to freely accept the unmerited and undeserved grace that you give us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can become all that you've made us to be. And finally, Lord, help us worship. Help us praise you through the storms, on the good days, on the bad days, and everything in between, Lord. We just want to honor you, and we want to fight the lies of the devil with the truth that you've provided us in your word, in these songs, in the context of community. Lord, you have given us so many amazing tools to combat the lies of the world. Help us do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Would you please stand as we close in worship?